on the hour. So let's get started with the session. So for those of you that haven't been to a live session before, one of these these sessions before, uh, which isn't many of you, but if you haven't, uh, then, then welcome. The way these sessions work, we run this particular one once a month. It's exactly 60 minutes. We stop on 60 minutes on these particular sessions and they work like this. We have pretty much 30 minutes of training, sometimes some announcements, and then 20, 25 minutes of Q&A, where I answer your questions. So 30 minutes of training first, then the Q&A. Now, if you've got questions, uh, you can ask questions about the content we'll cover today, or you can ask questions about anything. Anything you believe I can help you with, uh, ask the question. To ask the question, please do this. Uh, in the comments box where you've all been commenting, uh, just put a capital QQ, double Qs, in front, and also perhaps a question mark at the end as well, because that just helps me to spot, because we might find the, as you've seen already, the comments goes fairly mad. I, I, it's great when people comment, and I'll try and give a few shout outs when I see com particular comments that catch my eye, but I will be searching for those questions. So QQ at the front, if you have questions, we'll get to questions in about 35 minutes from now. Okay, so think of your questions. Think now, what do you want to know? Okay, um, second thing, many of you know that one of the things we do is we are, we're, we're big into an organiza organization called B1G1, uh, which is all about making the world a better place. There are so many people around the world worse off the, than we are. So every time you show up live to one of our sessions, then we make a contribution on your behalf to a worthy project. Pr project, And we change it, change it around every single time. This time for today's session, uh, we're actually one of the, the, the UN Global Goals is about climate change, uh, which is obviously a big issue. And so one of the things that we will be doing on your behalf for each and every one of you is Sarah will, will later on when we add up the numbers, we get a report of the numbers. And for everyone live, what we'll be doing is reducing one kilogram of carbon dioxide emissions uh, on your behalf. And the way it works specifically, I don't know how good your eyes are, if you can read that or not, I actually can't. But uh, uh, over in Singapore, there's a huge problem with food waste. And so that, and that creates a uh, uh, carbon dioxide emissions. So this project is all about really re reducing that food waste. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to make a contribution on your behalf every time we pick a different, a different project. Yesterday was homeless children. Today it's carbon dioxide emissions. So thank you for coming live. Whenever you come live, you are contributing to making the world a better place. Okay, the topic then for today is designing a business for success. It's the one that you chose last month. Usually these are value pricing based topics, but we mix it up a little bit and you get to choose. And the way that works if you're brand new is we kick off these sessions with a poll and the poll will determine what we do next month in next month's session. So we're going to do a poll. Now we're going to do it in a different way. We have never done this before. It could go horribly wrong. We're going to use some new uh, technology for this. And so what you're going to need to do, hopefully it'll work really well. It worked well in testing, uh, but uh, who knows? So we're using something called Slido for this. So all you need to do is on your smartphone or wherever you, whatever you've got or on your computer, just either, you've got three options. With your smartphone, you can use the QR code. You can either just go to slido.com and it'll ask you for a, a six digit code, which is 493364 for this event, or Sarah's gonna put into the comments box a link. So whichever way you, whichever way you do it, you, uh, it's up to you, QR code, just go to slido.com and put in those six numbers or look for the link that Sarah's going to share with you. And, uh, and, and what that will do is it'll take you to a page where there'll be two things, there'll be two tabs. I can see the, I can see the, the, uh, the link's gone into the Facebook group right now. There's two tabs, one says Q&A, one says poll. Please ignore the Q and A. Um, so ignore the Q&A tab, it's the poll one. So I'm gonna launch the poll right now and you can vote for the topics that are about to appear on the screen, which one you would like me to teach you next month. So if I just hit this button here, if the technology works, 
Here we go. So we can either, I can either look at different ways to help you add more value to your clients, which is fundamental to value pricing, or perhaps we look at the fundamentals of value pricing, or perhaps the, uh, hang on, this has just changed. Um, uh, it's, it's switching the order around on my screen. You can read it yourself. Um, it's running in real time, so you can see how the votes are coming in. Uh, the, uh, so we thought we'd have some fun with that. Um, we can talk about the upsells. So that means, uh, how do you be more specific about offering other things when people buy from you? That's the upsell. It's, so it's a marketing topic. Um, I, uh, uh, what else have we got? What else have I missed? Um, I think we've got one twice there, Sarah, have we? No, it's not. It's just because it's, just it's rejigging. Re uh, how to find the time to get more stuff done. So not a pricing one, more of a uh, how, do we find the, how do we find time, if that's important to you. It looks like at the moment, though, strategies for communicating value, which is a key part of value pricing, is coming out at number one. So I think, Sarah, I'm going to give this about five more seconds because it seems like it's fairly overwhelming uh, as to which one we're going to do. I don't think there's going to, is, we're not going to swing the votes, I don't think, with any additional ones. So I'm going to uh, let me lock the poll. Um, so we're going with strategies for communicating value. Let me st stop that poll. Uh, we don't need that anymore. Hopefully I've done that right. Um, OK, was that, did that work from your point of view as technology? Those of you that have been doing the polls before, we've used Zoom polls, we've used Facebook poll polls recently. But that meant you could see in real time what was actually going on. If you found that fun, perhaps that's what we might do going forward and using that technology for, for the polls. Um, OK, now having gone into Slido, don't use that again. OK, you may notice there's a box for Q&A. And it may be in the future we will be using that for Q&A as well. But for today's session, for today's session, <laughs> thanks for the feedback. Lisa says, great. Jody says, cool. Uh, William says, yes, no problems. Betty Watson said, Betty said... Uh, that was fun. Okay, I'm glad that was fun. Um, it was fun, wasn't it? Uh, fun because nothing went wrong, Michael said. Wonderful. Uh, yeah. Um, so, okay, that worked well. We will do the poll again in that particular way next time. And those of you that knew what we do is the one that came second, we put into the pot next month. So next month, you'll have four different topics plus the second place one, which is what will go into the pot for voting for the August session. OK, so that's August. Um, but next month, next month, we'll be teaching communication uh, strategies. And this month is the one that you voted last time, which was a strategy one, which is designing a business for success. OK, I think we're going to get uh, started. So um, uh, have I done all the announcements. I have. Yep. So we're going to have 30 minutes. Just so you know, uh, what we're going to be doing is is trimming this video when it's done afterwards. So I kind of um, will play a little video when I'm going to get started and just get into presentation mode. 30 minutes of content and then think of what about your questions. If you've got questions, stick them in the comments box with a QQ in front. OK, are you ready? Have you got your pen and paper to hand? Because you're going to want to make lots of notes. So this session is all about designing a business for success. And this is for you if you're an accountant or a bookkeeper running an accounting firm, because it will certainly apply to you to help you think about the big picture strategy. But this video, this training is also for you if you're an accountant or a bookkeeper and you want to help your clients build a more successful business. So this is all about business success for both your business, your accounting firm, but if you want to help your clients be more successful through perhaps business advisory, then this is a process, a thought process you can walk them through. So let's get into how to design a business for success. Okay, so if we're going to build a business to be successful, I guess we have to ask ourselves some questions. And I think the first question that we need to ask ourselves is, what's the purpose of a business? What's a business all about? Why do, why do we have a business? Now, for some people, it might be out of necessity. And perhaps it's because uh, they've been made redundant, they've been laid off, and initially, to start with, it's just something to, to get them an income so they can pay the mortgage, which 
a number of years ago happened to my brother. He was made redundant. And I said to him for many years, his, his name's Justin, I said to Justin, you should start your own business because you, would, you could build a great business. But he had a great job and was making good money. And then one day, suddenly out the blue, as it happens to many people, he was made redundant which is actually the best thing that could have happened to him because it forced him to take my advice and start his business. And he now runs a very successful business. So sometimes people start a business out of necessity. It's just something that, that happens. It's not a big plan. Events happen. But if we think about what really is the purpose of a business, and I think the person that sums it up best is Michael Gerber. And one of the things that uh, I do recommend that you read, one of the best business books ever, is The E-Myth Revisited by Michael Gerber. And one of the things he says in that, in his book, is he says that, he says business is just a boring, boring waste of time. Which I thought was interesting. But he goes on to say, the only purpose of a business is to give you more life. And so the question becomes, what's more life? And so if we're thinking about this idea of, of designing our business for success, the starting point of this whole thing has to be, so what is success for us? What is more life? What is it that we want out of our lives? We have to think about the end goal where we want to get to. And this is you in your existing business right now. You need to be thinking about this. But also if you're working with business owners, with your clients, uh, they need to think about this because very often they don't. Sometimes because people fall into business accidentally because of un unforeseen circumstances like redundancies, sometimes people just fall into business. And, and that's partly why they muddle along and, and struggle because they've not stopped to reflect and think about how they design a business for success. And so that starting point is, so what's more life? What do we want uh, out of our lives? What, what do we want our business to do? Because that's all the business is. It's a vehicle to help us achieve what we want. Whether that's financial goals, to build capital value, to allow, allow us to retire at the point that we want to in our lives, to, whether that's you know, retire early, whatever it might well be, to, uh, to have the ability to have the, the lifestyle that we want uh, at the end of the business. But not just that, also because retirement could be a long time away and we, know, we don't know what's going to happen in the meantime and whether we'll actually make it that far because unfortunately sometimes unexpected things like death happens. And so we shouldn't just be building a business for that eventual date when we might retire, but actually when we think about more life, more life is today as well. What are the things that you want to do with your life? What's important to you? And how can you structure a business to give you that. So I'm going to talk about how we structure it, the thought process that we go through. And I'll probably give a few examples. So uh, this is a process I went through about 15, 20 years ago in my business. And, and uh, you might know that I live in Portugal right now. And I've been here since with Sarah, uh, since the middle of 2020. And it was a, it's been a long term goal uh, to have a life where the sun shines, uh, the sun shines most, most days, the climate's better, uh, it's a more relaxed pace of life. There's uh, a beach just down the road, there's bars, cafes, there's a pool just outside. This took me along, this was all about designing a business for life. And not just that re when you're gonna retire, but how can you create a business that's gonna allow you to do the things that are important to you uh, from a day-to-day -day point of view, to, to live that life that, that you want, to give you the lifestyle that you want. Not just necessarily monetary, but also the freedom. Because unfortunately in life, too many business owners, accountants, bookkeepers, but your clients as well, work crazy hard. Are just working, working, working so hard, hoping that one day, magically, everything will suddenly turn out great. And the trouble is, when we work too hard and we're getting stressed, that can impact on our health's health, and it may be that as a result of that, perhaps if we, we burn out, we might not even make it to retirement. So we have to stop and plan. We have to think about big picture. And one of the things that we need to think about, which is really important, and, and, and when you're working with clients, is I think it's important to understand and ask ourselves the question, are we really running a business? And so let me talk for a second about this, this difference between 
running a business, being a business owner, and being self-employed. They are two different things. And when we understand that up here, things start to change. Self-employed essentially means you have a job. The only difference between self-employment and employment is with self-employment, the boss is you. The boss is you. And as Michael Gerber says in the e-myth, he says that you end up, when you're self-employed, working for a worse boss, i.e. you. You're a worse boss because you don't give yourself time off. You work crazy hard hours. There's no overtime. You work crazy hours. You never have time for holidays, vaca vacations. You are just working, working, working. And so you're perhaps better off working for somebody else and being an employee. So we need to understand this difference between self-employment and a business. And I remember talking to my father about this some years ago. Unfortunately, he's passed away now. But my father was a writer. He wrote books. He wrote magazine articles. And we had this conversation. And my father was very clearly self-employed. Uh, he loved what he did. He loved writing. But he wasn't interested in building a business. He was happy just doing the things that he liked doing, the writing. And so effectively, he had a job. He was a writer. His job was a writer. It just so happened, from a tax point of view, he was classed as a business. He was self-employed. You see, if we're building a business, if we're running a business, then we want to be thinking about the business as something that's more than just us. The business is something that has a life of its own. An idea, and ideally, a life that will continue without us when we've retired or when we go on holiday, vacations, whatever. And so my question is, are you really running a business? Or do you have something that relies 100% on you? If, if you? if you can't take three months out of your business starting next month, if you can't take three months out of your business, if it would disappear in three months, then you're probably self-employed. You're not really running a business. And that's, what, that's the problem with a lot of small businesses, whether it's accountants, bookkeepers, your clients. Uh, we, we don't build a business for success. We're just, we're just doing the work. We're just being busy. If you're a bookkeeper and you're doing bookkeeping all the time, then bookkeeping's a job. You're self-employed. If you're an accountant just doing tax returns, it's a job. That's a job. It's just that you're working for somebody else yourself. And that's a very different thought process to designing and building a business. So the way to think about this is if, you, if your business can operate to an extent without you and you're building some capital value, you're building something, this does not mean, by the way, it has to be big. I'm going to come on to later, uh, I'll talk a little bit about how you can apply the things I'm going to talk about and still be small. And there's nothing wrong with being small. And, and particularly with technology now, there's, many, there's, there's technology that makes it easier than ever to run a successful, profitable business without being huge. So, for example, just to pick up on my, my background, my story, uh, I had my previous business, uh, which I, I ran throughout largely 2003 to 2013, for about a decade. At one point, we had over 30 people in the team. It was a multi-million turnover business, big team of people. And interesting, I found when it got to the, the peak size, the, the, for me, the fun went out of it because I realized I didn't enjoy managing a team of people. I wasn't great at it. I, I didn't like the, the, the internal politics and all of the problems. It was a great business, some great people in it. But I found the fun went out for me. So the business I have now, today, it's a, it's a seven-figure business, but we're a team of four people now. It's Sarah and I, Sarah's daughter, and as of this week, uh, my daughter has started Gabby. So it's four of us. We're a small little, we're a small business. I have no intention of being a big, uh, multi, multi-million pound uh, international organization, but I still go through this thought process that I'm going to share with you. And the first thing, and we're going to draw some, we're going to draw some pictures during the course of today's session. So uh, just bear with me a second uh, because I need to get my pencil together. Uh, and the first thing that uh, if I need to do is press the right button first. Okay, so when we think of a business, 
And it, what we've got on screen is, as you'll see, it's kind of an organization chart. But the first thing we have to think about is we have to start thinking about what all the boxes, what all the things a business does. What does a business do? And one of the things that we, if you're a business owner, one of the things, one of the positions you have that we, that we all have when we run a business is we are all in this box that we can label owner. And you'll see there's a dotted line underneath that because there's something very important that we need to think about. Because every business, however big or, big or small, even if, you're, even if you are a solo practitioner, just you, no team members, you still are doing things in your business that a multi-million turnover firm business would do. do. There are things that we all have in common in our businesses that we do. And one of those is that there is an owner. But also in a business, there is, I'm going to put manager, but more, I guess it, in the US, you would call it the CEO. In the UK, we would use it as a managing director, the MD. You have, if you like, the boss. And in most small businesses, most small bookkeeping firms, most small accounting firms, the owner and the manager is the same person. It's the same person. In my business, I'm in both those boxes. And that's fine. For most small businesses, the owner also happens to be the managing director, CEO, senior partner, uh, whatever, it, whatever it might well be. Now, in a corporate structure, we get a sense of this, of this difference from a, a tax point of view, from a legal point of view, because an owner would be a shareholder and the the manager would be the CEO or the MD. And so in a corporate environment, whether or not they're the same people, they have different, there's different tax treatments. One takes dividend, one takes salary, uh, remuneration as a, as a manager. But if we think about a partnership, if we think about a, a sole trader business, we don't have this, that distinction. The sole trader is the owner and the manager. They do everything. And so we tend to muddle it all together but what we have to recognize is that there's a very big difference between the role of an owner and the role of a manager. So if I go back to here, you see the, the, the purpose, the, the role of the owner, the responsibility of the owner is to think about, they want to be thinking about capital value. The other thing that's important to them because the owner owns the business. It's about this business is going to build something for them that perhaps could be sold at some point. So capital value is very important. And the other thing is return on investment. It may be that we've invested not just time, but perhaps money into our business. And we want to get a return on that, return on that in the form of, if it's a corporate, it would be a dividend, but it would be Effectively, it's our profits. If it's a, for a small business, it's our profit. So profit and capital value is what the owner is concerned with. Now, the manager or the CEO or the MD, their responsibilities, their roles are implementing strategy, putting the strategy into place, figuring out uh, better ways to deliver on the promise, to add value, to serve customers better, and also to develop the skills and knowledge of the team. That's, that's what the, MD, the managing director, the CEO, is there to do. It's to, it's to put the strategy in place. It's to create a better product, add more value, to keep customers happy, great service, great adding value, develop the team, and so on. And the reason it's important to think of those two things as being different is if we want to build a business for success, we have to make sure that we are doing the things that we're spending some of the time with that owner's hat on. And that means from a practical point of view, it means that we need to spend time having strategic thinking. So if you're the owner of a business, if you're the owner, then in a corporate structure, of course, the, the, the managing director is running a business and is responsible to the shareholders, the owner. The shareholders want return investment. They want capital value. And so in a smaller business as an owner, we need to be thinking about all the time strategy. We need to be thinking about vision. 
Where do we want this business to go? What do we want this business to be like? What's the vision? What's the core purpose of this business? What are the, because we own it, what's the core purpose? What are the values of this business? What's the direction that we need to go in? That's the, we set the course. And that's the job of the owner. The problem is in too many small businesses. We don't think about the difference between owner and manager. We're just doing the work. We're doing the work and never taking that step back and thinking holistically. So if you want to build a business for success, you have to start off by thinking about your role as an owner and doing the things that you should be doing to focus on capital value, return investment, to think about strategic planning. You should be having strategic retreats at least once a year, plan the strategy for the year ahead. Think about the vision, think about what you want to achieve. And then let the manager worry about implementing the strategy, managing the resources, managing the people, and making sure we deliver on the promise to customers. And it may well be that you're the same person, you're in both of those boxes, but it means we mustn't muddle it up. We must make sure that we're putting aside time to spend time as the owner, to do the things the owner should do. Okay, let's move on. Because when we think about a business, every business is made up of different functions. A business does different things. And there, are, for most businesses, there are five core functions in a business. So one of those things that we have to do in business is we have to generate sales leads. We have to get people interested in buying from us. This is called marketing. So we have a function called marketing. And we would have in a larger business, we would have somebody in charge of that. That could be the marketing director. Uh, in, in the UK, we call them directors. Um, the marketing executive officer, I'm not sure what you call it in the US, but the market, head of marketing. Then you've got to then convert those leads into customers. And that's the role of sales. That would be the sales director. Someone needs to be responsible for converting sales. Because if we don't do marketing, if we don't do sales, we're not going to get customers. We're not going to have a business. And the trouble is a lot of small businesses, when you're thinking about your smaller clients, very often they don't have anyone focused on marketing or sales. And they're not growing as a result. There needs to be some focus there. Then, of course, every business does something. And so we have to deliver on the promise. We have to, the, the marketing's the promise. We make a promise to people that we will do something, for example, complete their tax return. So we have to then, op we have to deliver on that. We have to have uh, some operational function. So I call that operations. So that would be the, the chief operating officer, for example, will be head of operations. Then, of course, we've got to manage the money. So we have a finance function. And then we also have to manage people and resources. So we would have, I'll put people here, but it may be an HR director, human resources director. They're the core functions that every business have. Even if you are just a solo practitioner, it's just you. Even if it's just you, those things happen in your business. You have to do those things. Somebody has to do the marketing. Somebody has to do the sales. Somebody has to do the operations. Some, somebody's got to add up the numbers and do the end of year financial statements. And then it may well be that the people bit, if you are a solo, perhaps that doesn't apply. But as soon as you hire somebody, then you've got to manage them. And so the question then to ask yourself, the next question, and if you're working with clients, if you're working with business owners, the question to ask them would be, how much time do you spend in the boxes? How much time do you spend in each of the boxes? And so if, for example, you are a, a solo bookkeeper, for example, you would probably find that you're spending 80% doing bookkeeping for clients, probably then doing your own bookkeeping, and you might dabble in a bit of marketing or sales, or it might even be it's in totally 90%. It may be there's no time for sales and marketing. If that's the case, you're really self-employed. You're not building a business. Because if we want to build a business, what we want to do is, and to use the words of Michael Gerber, is we want to get out of the boxes. Because whenever you are working in the boxes at the bottom part of the chart, you have a job. If you're doing tax returns, then you're not the business owner at that point in time. You are doing the job 
of someone who prepares tax returns. If you're doing the bookkeeping, you are a bookkeeper, not a business owner. And we have to understand that. That doesn't mean that we have to be big. We might want to be a small business, but we can still think about how we can build that business to help us achieve what we want out of life. And so how do we do that? What we want, what we want to do is think about and draw some boxes and think about all the things that happen in our business. What are all the functions and the things that happen? And you want to be spending an increasing, increasingly more time on the things at the top end of the chart. If you want to design a business for success, you have to spend more time doing the strategic planning. Think about the vision. That's critically important. And less time doing the work. So how do we do that? Well, one of the ways we do it, and if you read the E-Myth Revisited by Michael Gerber, he talks about systems, that we have to put systems in place in those boxes. What's the marketing system? What's the sales system? We create systems. And then once we create those systems, then we can go and find somebody to run those systems. We can hire somebody. And then a mistake we often make in small businesses is we look at that chart and think, I, I, don't, want, I don't like sales. I hate sales. I know I need to sell to grow my accounting firm. I hate sales. I'm going to hire an experienced salesperson. So we're going to hire somebody to do, do the selling for our firm. And then we realize that they're not winning any business whatsoever. Sales are awful. And the reason that happens is because we can't just hire people and, and abdicate responsibility. We have to put a system in place first. We have to figure out how do we do it in our business? What's the, how do we convert clients, convert prospects to clients? What's the process that we use in our business? You're the business, business owner. As a business owner, it's your vision. It's your business. You have to set the rules. You have to figure out what it is that makes your business different and how do you do it? What are the processes you work through to, to do marketing, to hire, to find new clients, to hire people, the operational stuff? We have to systemize that. Once we've systemized it, it's then much, much easier to hire people. So in my business, we have a small business. We, keep sim we, we can keep, systems can be simple. Systems can be as simple as just a checklist, a standard form, a standard letter. I love Trello as a tool, and we have a Trello board. We have a systems board on Trello where we have cards for all the key things that we do, including the tech stack, for example. So when somebody new starts, my daughter started last week, then there's a Trello card for the things that we do. So we have to systemize each function, and then we hire people. And then what we have to do is teach the system. And that's a step that's often forgotten, is we hire somebody and say, right, you're in charge of sales now. There's, there's the systems we follow. Just get on with it. And then we wonder why they mess up. If you've ever hired somebody and they've messed up, it's very tempting to blame them because they've messed up. In most cases... Not all cases, but in most cases, 90% of the time or more, someone messes up because we didn't either create the system for them or we didn't teach them the system. We didn't spend the time showing them how to follow the system. Okay, so that's, that's essentially um, the process that we need to go through to think about designing a business. We need to think about the functions and then we need to think about the strategy of how we get out of those boxes. Now, I said to you earlier, that you don't have to build a big business, okay? It's not, it, it doesn't mean you have to build something that's going to be a, a multi-million pound business. But even if you just want to, if, if you want to stay as a small business, you can do that using technology these days. There's so many ways we can automate things without hiring a whole ton of people. I mentioned my example, so we have four of us, that's it. We have four of us and it's a seven-figure business. Because as long as you've created systems, rather than hiring people internally, it may be those systems are operated through technology. There's technology that we can use, uh, much, uh, much more technology now than, than when I ran my accounting firm many years ago. Technology that will help us to do things systematically, efficiently, do things fast. We can also outsource. Outsourcing's a, a great opportunity if we don't want to build the internal team. So I, I outsource uh, many functions in 
my business right now. We have somebody manage the Facebook ads. We have a designer does our design work. We have, we have a, a videographer who helps me set up things like the video studio. And if I'm doing video training programs, he does the editing. We don't have to hire these people. We can outsource them. Okay, so that's how we think about designing a business for success. We think about all the functions, all the things that have to be done in the business. And then recognize that our primary role, the most important thing is we're the owner. And so it's about the strategy, the systems, the vision, how we're going to build that business. Okay, we're going to go into questions now. So if you've got any questions, uh, either on this topic or anything else, then put QQ in front of the question, remember? QQ in front of the question. I'm not sure. I've not been watching the, the, uh, the comments, so I'm going to... Uh, let me just flick through. There is a, at least one question I can see. Uh, yeah, okay, so let me move on to... Uh, someone said, sorry, I'm late. Uh, Philip's late. Philip, you're late again. Uh, no problem, Philip. <laughs> Cedar's late. No problem. Uh, Lisa uh, has got the first question. Let's answer Lisa's question. Uh, so uh, Lisa says, so how do you move from being alone to building a business? So busy all the time, it's difficult to build time for building in my schedule or schedule if you're in the UK. At least that's a, that, that's a really good question. How do you move from being alone? Well, firstly, you need to decide whether that's what you do want to do. I'm not, I'm not saying that not everybody wants to build a business. I talked about the outset that, at the outset that some people, uh, there's business owners and they're self-employed. My father, my dad, he never wants to build a business. He was happy being self-employed. And that's fine if that's you or if you're talking to a client and that's the case. It's not a problem. For some people, that's all they want to do. But just bear in mind that being self-employed is effectively having a job and we're not building something. So if we do want to build a business, if we want to build a business, uh, how do we move from uh, being al alone uh, well, we can hire people, of course. We can, we can hire people to, to, in the business. I don't, personally, I don't want to build a big team of people because I'm rubbish at managing people. I don't like managing people. And so for me, it's more about figuring out how can I automate and systemize processes? Uh, how, can I, how can I have external people that are either outsourcing in the conventional thinking of outsourcing or external people doing some of the things that the business does. So as those of you that are in the Value Pricing Academy know that I'm not the only trainer. We have, uh, we have uh, Teresa does sessions uh, every single month, Teresa Slack. We also, uh, we've got uh, a couple of other trainers uh, coming on board fairly soon, which I will be revealing details fairly soon. And this is part of my, it goes back to the, kind of the, the, the thinking uh, as a business owner, as the strategy, the vision, where do you want to get to? And so I've been thinking very hard about what's my vision, what do I want the firm to look like, but I don't want to hire hundreds of people. I want to figure out other ways of doing it by having joint ventures in place, by outsourcing, by systemizing, by simplifying the business as much as possible. Um, I've gone off tangent from your question, Lisa, so let me go back to the question again just to get me back onto track. Sometimes I do this, I ramble. So how do you move from being alone to building a business so busy all the time that it's difficult to build, to, to build time for building in my schedule? Uh, so one of the things you're going to have to do, if you're, if, you're, if you're busy all the time, busy doing the work, remember that if you're busy doing tax turns, if you're busy doing bookkeeping, then you're just self-employed, you've got a job. And that might be fine. But if that's not where you want to get to, if you want to build a business, if you want to build something, you have to make time to think about the bigger picture, the strategy, and design that business and working out what systems you're going to create. And are you going to outsource some of those, those functions? Or are you going to hire somebody and train them to do that function? So you have to create some time. You have to create some space. And many of you will know the, way, the best way of doing that is exit some, exit some clients. Because if you're busy, it's probably because you've got too much work on. 
If you're too busy to do the strategizing, if you're too busy to do the marketing or to build the systems or to train the team, if you're too busy, it's probably because you've got too much work, too many clients, too many customers. And that's usually because we're too cheap. And when we're too cheap, we're busy trying to win more clients because we need the extra money to make ends meet. And so if you're in a situation where you lost, say, 20% of your clients right now, if you really struggle, then you're probably in that position where you're constantly worrying about the next client because you need to pay the bills. And so there's a pricing issue at the heart of it. Pricing is at the heart of most problems in business. If you are working crazy hard, it's probably because you are pricing too cheap. And so it's really important to go through a process of looking at your clients right now and repricing. And as you, as you know, I've shared this before several times. If you put your price up by 20%, even if you lost 20% of your clients, you're no worse off. But you've just filled up, a day, you just freed up a day a week. You filled up, freed up fr Friday. Now you can spend Friday being the business owner. Friday is owner day. Friday is the day that you spend thinking about the vision, the strategy, the plan. It's also the day that you're the CEO. And that's the day that you're putting the strategy in place. You're in those top two boxes on Fridays. And so we have to get our pricing right to get the, to, to free up the time and the resource so that we can do that. I hope that helps, Lisa. Uh, let's um, uh, move on. Uh, Nancy says, congratulations to Gabby. I think Gabby might actually be listening. Uh, just so you know, uh, it's spelt G-A-B-I, but that's fine. Um, Gary says the same thing. So a few welcomes for you, Gabby. Uh, Sherry says the same thing. Um, uh, Oh, Lisa got it. Okay, Lisa's telling everybody how it should be spelled. Uh, thank you, Lisa. You remembered. Uh, okay. Um, uh, let me look for some more questions. There's lots of comments. I might come back to some comments, but let me answer some more questions first. Um, question. Matthew O'Hara. Matthew says, uh, in, a, in a single owner director practice, would it be more ad ad advantageous? Contagious is that to replace myself with an equivalent skilled person and then spend more time strategizing for success, e.g. focusing on systems that can deliver a strategic plan. Um, let me just read that one more again, one more time, because that was a long question, Matthew. In a single uh, owner stroke director practice, would it be more adv advantageous to replace myself with an equivalent skilled person? You could do. I think, from my own experience, I, I think it's more important to focus on the systems first. Get the systems in place because most businesses are not as systemized as they think. As they think, there may be some functions we've got systemized, and usually they're at the lower the lower levels. We have, we have systems for. Uh, let me think. Um, well, we we often have the operational systems, the systems for how we complete a tax return. And we always and we use software for doing a lot of that. So software that does bank reconciliations is a system. OK, so we do have a lot of systems, but there are a lot of things that we don't systemize. There's a lot of in, in small businesses, a lot of stuff happens at random. And so I, I would always suggest that someone once taught me uh, who I, a, a colleague once said that a, a, mis a mistake that we often fall into is hiring ourselves out of a problem. We have a challenge, we, we want to free up some time, we, we, what, there's a, a process or something we don't want to do, uh, or we're getting too busy with one more clients, and so the solution is let's just hire somebody. When we hire somebody else, that'll solve all our problems. And actually, my experience, and the experience of a lot of people I've spoken to, is hiring people actually creates more problems. And so, and, and, and that's because, and, and that's partly because uh, some of us, I'm not good at managing. I, I know that. I've learned that the hard way by making a mess at some of the, the businesses I've run. I've learned I'm, I can't manage people. I'm not a great people person. And I don't mean to insult anybody, but I, I kind of sense that accountants, bookkeepers generally aren't very good at managing people. <laughs> It's not just me. I think it's a trait of being... Um, we are very, very good at certain things. We are very systematic in our thinking. Uh, we are very ordered. Uh, very or ordered. We're very meticulous at doing things. Uh, and so that's our strength. And I would always focus on get the systems right first. Focus on the systems. And when you get the systems right, you might then realize, Matthew, that once you've systemized it and, and now perhaps using some technology, perhaps you don't need to hire somebody. Perhaps... 
you could outsource or just use technology. So I'm not saying don't hire somebody, but I would say that's not necessarily going to solve your problems. Uh, focus on systemizing the business, simplifying the business. Sometimes we just overcomplicate things too much. And I know, and I do that. I'm a business owner. And as, as a business owner, we have these bright, shiny objects we chase, these new things we want to do. We want to launch this new thing. We want to sell this new service. We have all these wonderful ideas we want to do. And sometimes as a result of that, we overcomplicate things. When, just to give you an example of that, Matthew, um, 18 months ago, we got to a stage in the business where things weren't growing the way that we wanted. And we used to sell a lot of courses. And so we were constantly creating more courses, creating more courses. And if you went to our website 18 months ago, there was about three pages of courses that we sold. And then we made a decision. That's just way too complicated. Let's do one thing. We took all the courses off the website. We stopped selling them. I know they make money, but we were losing focus. We were too scattered. Sometimes we do too many things. We lose focus. And so going back to the owner role, as an owner and strategizing, we want to get that focus back. What's really important? What's the thing that we should focus on? What's the th For the next 12 months, if we want to achieve this goal, what's the thing we have to do? And do that really, really well. And the other eight or nine projects we're working on, park them because we can't do all these things. We, when we lose that focus, we just become busy fools. Matthew, I hope that kind of helps a little bit. Let's move on to another question that I've got. Uh, I'm not sure if I know what the name is, turning numbers into knowledge. Uh, oh, it's not a question anyway. <laughs> Oops, didn't mean to put a QQ on that. Uh, okay, that's fine. Um, it's easy to forget the other way around, not to put the QQ. Uh, um, but it was an interesting idea, so I will show it. So uh, create a day like Money Monday or Finance Friday to work on the business. I think that's a great idea. That's what I did uh, back in 1998. So November 98, I was two and a half years into running my sole practitioner business. Two and a half years in, I was working crazy hours. Uh, I'd grown it from me. And I forget, I forget how many people I had then. I know it peaked at 13 people in the team. And that's when the fun went out of my business, my, my accounting business. Um, in, in November 98, I probably had about seven or eight people. And I wasn't making any money. And I, I kept thinking the answer was to keep hiring somebody else. If I hire another accountant, another bookkeeper to do the work, at some point, the, the money will start to come in if I, if I just focus on building this business. And it was... It was when I first met Steve Pipe on the, the masterclass, which I may have told you some of you about, which was in nine, November 1998. And one of the things that that really got me thinking about the bigger picture and the strategizing. And what I did is I, I then blocked out Fridays. Uh, for me, Fridays, I called it working on the business day. So a bit similar to what the idea was here. Uh, I, was, I spent Fridays work on the business. I, for the next year, I didn't book any client work whatsoever on a Friday. Instead, I spent that day primarily putting systems in place because I realized that in my firm, like most of us, all the systems were in my head. I was a sole practitioner and I knew how to do everything, but I was, I, the, team were, the, the team were making mistakes because I'd not put the systems in place in the first place for them to follow. And that's very often the mistake that we make. Okay, let's, um, let's ask some other questions. Sybil's got a question. Sybil, hi there. Uh, how to outsource the marketing? I find I love meeting and getting to know prospects. Thus, I believe I'm better at sales, but can't seem to get the leads. Okay, so I did a video on YouTube about this about three or four months ago because somebody asked me a similar question. And I know that a lot of people in the profession, we're, not, we're accountants or bookkeepers, and, and we're not... We're not necessarily, we're not trained marketers. However, I think it's a big mistake to, again, to use Michael Gerber's language, to abdicate responsibility. I don't like marketing. I'm not good at marketing. I'm going to hire someone to do it. I'm going to outsource the marketing. That's not going to work because your business is unique. When, when we think about marketing, if you want to be successful at marketing, marketing strategy is so important. 
And marketing strategy is things like your positioning statement, your ideal clients. And only you can decide that. Only you, It's your business. You have to decide what is the work you love. What's the type of client you want? What do they look like? What do they feel and smell like? What work do you want to do? What are you passionate about? What's the wording and the messaging that you're going to use to attract those people to your firm? This is all a marketing strategy. And really only you can do that. And... One of the things that we, so the mistake we make is we, we, we delegate stuff, we outsource stuff to somebody else. And actually, as a business owner, if we want to build successful business, we have to understand our business. We have to understand everything about our business. And that means that we have to figure things out. We have to figure out what's the marketing that works really well. Let's, let, let's try, let's, let's put some referral systems in place. Let's try some social media stuff. We put some marketing in place. We test, we see what works. Once we've got our marketing working, then we can hire someone to do it. When I started this business, which was in 2014, I, I grew it to a quarter of a million before I had my first person, which was Sarah joined me. Sarah joined me 18 months later. For the first 18 months, I did everything. I figured out how to create a lead page. I wrote an ebook. I figured out how to collect leads. I figured out uh, how to write and create a website. I figured out the language that I needed to use. Because as an owner, we have to figure these things out. Once we've done that, once we've created, the, once we've figured it out and we've created a system and a structure, then we can bring somebody in to do the work. And I know people don't like that answer. People want the easy answer. They think, oh, I just hire somebody. That'll take all my problems away. It doesn't. It doesn't. We have to create the systems first. And to create the systems, we have to figure out how that works in the business. What's the best selling system in our business? We have to, we have to, I saw Martin Bissett's here. We have to learn from people. Go and learn from Martin. How do you sell accounting services? Then you learn from Martin. You you play with it a bit and figure out the scripts and the process that works for you. Once you've got a selling system that works for you, for your firm, document it, systemize it, and then by all means hire somebody and teach them the system. But we have to figure things out ourselves first. Okay, um, Cindy Tan, I think this is a couple of questions here. Cindy says, uh, how do you know when it's time to hire your first employee and what do you need to do when employing staff for the first time? Uh, how do you know it's time to hire your first, uh, your first person? It's going to be different for everybody. Uh, it's going to be different. A lot of it depends on your strategy, your vision, your goals, where do you want to get to, get to this next 12 months. Uh, um, one of the things that uh, I, I learned was that, so a couple of, one of the things I learned is that we have to have, we have to have the systems, the process in place first. And it's really important we ha when we do hire somebody, we invest some time to teach them the processes. So they do things the right way consistently every single time. So I think, that's, I think that's really important. Uh, another thing that, that I learned, I made so many hiring mistakes. So I grew my accounting firm from just me to 13 people. I think that was, I got to 13 people after about three and a half, four years. And, and hiring mistakes were some of the biggest mistakes I made. Pricing was number one mistake. Number two was hiring. And one of the things that I did was I, I hired people when I was, desperate so for some work as it uh, desperate for someone to do the work I, I i'd bring in about three or four more clients and think crikey i'm really busy now I, I need to hire someone fast to do this i used to hire in a rush and i made so many hiring mistakes because i was in i suddenly needed somebody or i thought i needed someone fast and sometimes i would ignore my gut feel and hire the first person that walks through the door i have so many stories of bad hiring mistakes and and so we have to be more strategic about uh, our growth, our hiring. We have to get the systems in place. And we also have to do it so that we take our time hiring the right person. We have to really think about what is the right personality we need? What is the right sort of person? Uh, Teresa Slack talks a lot about personality profiling, those of you that have uh, done her training, uh, which is really important to understand really the sorts of people that we need, that we want. Uh, and then we need to make sure that we when we go through the hiring process, we listen to our gut. And if people, if, if we've got four people interv to interview and none of them feel right, we don't hire them on just because we need somebody, we wait. And so it needs to be part of a longer term strategy. Uh, Cindy also said, uh, 
How do you choose which process to automate first? That's a really good question. So when we're automating our processes, so if you think about going back to all the boxes, and, and when I drew that, drew that picture earlier, uh, let's see if I can draw it back, pull it back up. When I drew that picture earlier, let me just finish off the picture. Um, obviously, uh, all these main functions, market, marketing, sales, there's a whole bunch of functions underneath those. So in finance, you would probably have the bookkeeping function, um, you can't see that, bookkeeping function, separate to the accountant function. So you've got someone doing the bookkeeping and then you may have someone doing the end of year accounts in a business. Uh, you'll have different levels of marketing. You might have that, uh, you'll also have customer service and a whole bunch of other functions. So where do you start? Where do you start? As a general rule of thumb, because there are in any business, in any business, there are hundreds if not thousands of systems. It really is overwhelming. There are so many things that happen in a business. Uh, and so I, I, when I said I took Fridays off to work on the business, I spent a full 12 months systemizing my accounting firm. And I still didn't have systems for everything. Uh, there wasn't a system for making the tea, for example. But the systems that you want to focus on is, firstly, the most important systems are very often the customer focus systems. Systems that impact on the customer are the ones that I would start with. So they're the systems for onboarding a new client. The systems for how you sign off, the, deliver, the, deliver the, 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 the work to the client. The systems for getting their feedback. The systems for asking referrals. Systems that impact on the customer facing are the most important ones. So start there. Uh, the second thing that I would do as well, the second thing I would focus on is, I asked that question earlier, um, where, would you, where do you spend, your, what, what percentage of your time do you spend in the boxes? So think about what you do a lot of. What do you spend a lot of time doing that somebody else could perhaps do at some point in the future if you just systemized it? When I started my accounting firm, uh, I was doing a lot of tax planning. And one of the things I did a lot of in the 1990s were in corporations where I'd meet with a client or potential client and they were a sole trader partnership. There were opportunities to save tax by incorporating. And I had these internal systems, these scripts and this process. That was one of the first systems I, I created. I created this, the systems and passed that on to my client managers. And they then did all the incorporations. And because I'd, uh, I'd systemized it so well, I didn't have to be involved in that any, anymore. So think about customer-focused fo ones, customer-facing systems, and those systems where you spend uh, most of your time. That's where you're going to get the biggest, uh, the, the biggest return your investment in the time you spend. Okay, um, uh, uh, Linda says, I'm not sure what the context is, but she says, a great book is The 12-Week Year. I've not read that book, Linda, but thank you for that. But you also asked a question. Um, how are we doing for time? Three minutes left. We'll get about two more questions in. So Linda says, a great book to help prioritize and reduce the shiny things. Oh, it wasn't a question. It was just a, it's, it's a book recommendation from Linda. So make a note of that. Uh, okay. Um, I don't know what your name is, Earth Angel. Um, we'll go with Earth Angel. That's fine with me. So uh, question. I keep getting contacted from businesses in India to outsource to them. What do you think of this idea? Is it safe to outsource data to entry offshore? Uh, is it safe? Uh, I'm going to recommend that you post that question in my big Facebook group, Value Pricing with Mark Wickersham, and ask the group. My view on outsourcing is it definitely can work. Uh, outsourcing has now been around for at least two decades. When I was running my accounting firm, I explored outsourcing. It was fairly early then, and a lot of people really struggled with it and didn't get it to work. Uh, I think it's got more sophisticated now. There are, I've heard of some firms who are making it work really, really well, and others have found it a disaster. And one of the things that I found is that if you're going to go down the route of outsourcing to a place like India, to a place like the Philippines, you have to, it's a big project to set the whole thing up. You have to be really serious about that as part of your, it's got to be part of your, your strategy. If that's the way you want to go, then by all means, it can work. And what I recommend you do is ask a question in groups like my, my Facebook group and figure out who's made it work and who are they using to outsource to. I agree, there are, I get contacted by people from India all of the time and most of them I would avoid, but there's some good ones. 
There's some good ones. So ask around. The best people to ask, don't ask me. Ask people who are doing it. Find other accountants and bookkeepers who are, out, who are outsourcing successfully and, uh, and, and use their same contacts and processes. Uh, I think that's actually the last question as far as I can see. Um, as far as I can see. So let me just wrap up. Um, there's a few other comments. Some people, have, some people in Canada have joined Pure Bookkeeping System, which I know is, is, is great. Uh, so we have one minute. So let me tell you about what's coming next. If I can remember, tomorrow, if you're in the Online Live Academy, uh, I'm going to be, uh, the, our next session is tomorrow, and we're going to be looking at how to communicate with confidence on camera. So that's if you're in the Online Live Academy. On Friday, same time as this, we have our 60-minute effective pricing Q&A session with someone very special. It's Emily doing it. Uh, I'll be hosting it, but it'll be Emily. She'll be teaching you how to build really professional-looking proposals inside the effective pricing software and, uh, and how, to, how to use Canva to, as a great design tool and how to take designs in Canva and put them into effective pricing. If you have no idea what effective pricing is and you want a system for value pricing, come along on Friday, you'll find out more. That's Friday's session. Okay, I have no live sessions next week, at least Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, because it's Value Pricing Academy week. So if you're in the Value Pricing Academy, I'll be teaching you all next week. There's no, no uh, public live sessions uh, until next Friday when we do the next Effective Pricing Q&A session. Okay, thank you so much for coming along. As usual, I'll play out with some music. If you found this valuable, please give it the thumbs up, the like button. Uh, if you've got any comments, stick them in the comments box. Me and my team, we read all of the comments. I will see you again soon. Goodbye for now. I wasted all my time, I wasted all my nights, I wasted it on someone who's indifferent. He didn't love me right, he told me I was blind, but I never really wanted to listen.